it has been a long week. So we had Hurricane Milton kind of graze us. The winds were, uh, they were up there about 80, 90-ish miles an hour. I think uh, we're peak gusts here near Orlando. Uh, some people experienced heavy flooding. We thankfully didn't. We did have some downed trees and we had a power outage that lasted about three days. Now I, in that time, was pondering my server setup in the closet because I noticed when the power went out that there were a few things I could improve upon. And so in this video, I wanna talk about some of the changes we will be making over the next few weeks, some of the bottlenecks I've noticed, and uh, what we're gonna to do to address those. Now, most of you are already aware of our server rack. This is the one we built a few months ago for the new house, which we are currently in. You can see this is situated right next to the office, and to the right of that, we've got our like storage, inventory, closet, all the goodies in there. But basically we have all the cat, uh, cat six in the house terminating in this room here. And uh, it all gets funneled into the patch panels uh, that surround this 48 port switch, which we'll be upgrading in this video, by the way. Uh, but when the power went out, like, this is the first time that this server rack had actually been truly tested by a strong storm like Hurricane Milton. I had about an hour to an hour and a half of continuous power and actually Wi-Fi, like working internet, after all of the power in the house was cut out, thanks to this UPS down here. Please ignore Aldebron, our compute server is quite dirty. It seems like after only like a month or two of running, that you just get these big dust rings over these intake fans, and that's because this thing works quite a bit in the background. Uh, but this CyberPower UPS uh, came in super handy the night of the storm. In fact, if we click through here, you can see we're pretty much, we're not drawing any power from the UPS itself. There is power passing through it, which is why it's showing something, uh, but we have power at the house, so there's no reason for the UPS to actually be supplying the power by itself. Uh, but there is one, let's see, no, okay, this one here. Yeah, so this shows us estimated runtime currently at about 75 minutes if we cut power to the UPS itself. And so something I noticed when the storm hit was that that estimated runtime was significantly lower than it is now, somewhere around 20 or 30 minutes. I thought that was far too low. And it turns out I'd actually plugged in pretty much every server in this rack, including uh, Aldebron and Polaris, which is my NAS. That's where I store all of my video footage for, for projects like this. Uh, all of that was plugged into the UPS, which in hindsight made no sense. I'm not going to be editing, I'm not going to be accessing footage from my NAS when we're being hit with a you know, severe storm. It doesn't really make sense. So I disconnected those and just left the important things. So the NVR, for starters, this is uh, this is gonna house the hard drives that store all of the footage from our security cameras around the house. That's obviously super important, especially when power goes out. Looting can become an issue. Your house can be vulnerable. I saw that firsthand with Hurricane Michael back in Panama City. Uh, and then I also wanted to keep the uh, 48 port switch powered as well as the UDM Pro and the modem. So as long as those three things up top are powered, I'll still have Wi-Fi, my access points will still be powered thanks to PoE, and I should in theory still be able to uh, connect devices, especially portable devices like laptops, to the uh, RJ45 ports throughout the house and get wired LAN that way. So that was issue number one that needed to be rectified. You can see I've got these two larger power cables now plugged directly into uh, dedicated outlets in the wall. And uh, we had this closet designed with high power draw in mind, which is why we have a four outlet uh, set up here. And this is actually on a dedicated breaker in the garage. And of course we had this conveniently located just below my office. So you can see uh, breaker 17 there, so that's AV closet. That's the closet I just showed you. So if I cut this breaker off, it would only turn off power to the uh, server rack. So the idea would be to purchase some sort of uh, generator, something that can maybe tap into uh, just the, the grid. Like I don't really care much for solar right now. It's just really expensive. I don't want to finance it. They put like an extra lean on your house when you finance solar and I just don't want to deal with all that mess. So I'd rather just have a generator that taps into the grid uh, and kind of passively stores juice. That's something else I think we're gonna need. We live in Florida, hurricanes are pretty frequent. But there's more, actually much more. And I've purchased stuff that's probably not gonna be here by the time this video goes live, but I, I wanna walk you through my thought process, some of the things I have ordered, uh, just to kind of give you some insight into how I'm preparing for future storms now that I've endured one that admittedly could have been a lot worse. Uh, places further west, like uh, Tampa, St. Petersburg, even as far down south as Sarasota, uh, Bradenton, Fort Myers, a lot of those places had already been hit by recent hurricanes, other storms, and then they just got whacked by Milton again. I told myself after seeing the effects of Hurricane Michael that I, I would never live on the coast again. It's, just, it's not for me. I know some folks, they're okay with it. They are, they're okay with dealing with insurance and claims and rebuilding. To some, it's like a clean slate and, and they welcome 
that. But uh, you know, I'm I, we've just started a family. I've got two young kids. We're trying to find schools and whatnot. We're just trying to settle down. And uh, that's why we picked Orlando, the outskirts of Orlando. We're actually fairly high up, about 200 feet above sea level here. Uh, that's not to say that we can't flood. That actually has happened fairly recently because of some grading issues, which we thankfully fixed before Milton hit. This to me is just more peace of mind. It's cheaper for insurance uh, because we don't have to deal with uh, the risk of, of, of coastal storm surge and the like, but we still get some winds every now and then. I've got a few things to hopefully make this a bit more livable during those rough situations. We've got a lot more to show you, and I hope you'll stay with me. If you're planning your next PC build, then consider checking out our sponsor, VIP SCD Key. Their Windows 10 and 11 OEM keys sell for a fraction of retail and will unlock the full potential of your OS. They'll also remove those pesky activation watermarks. Click the links below to get started today and be sure to use our special offer code SKGS for a sweet discount on a variety of options, including Windows 10 and 11, Pro and Home, and more. Now there's one thing with our server rack that you probably noticed that really bothered you and don't worry, it bothers me too. You know, us gaming PC builders often complain about graphics card sag. Check this out. Check out Switch sag. That's pretty rough. Now there are some things you could buy that'll prop it up from the rear, but it's not really going to be stable unless we've got beams going all the way across. We kind of did that with Polaris here. You can see we've got, uh, actually this is a, an arm that extends outward, so I could pull this entire server out if I wanted to access things on top of it. Uh, it's not really needed for a, a Switch like this, but I'm going to do my best to tighten these down once we're finished swapping this Switch switch for this brand new one right here. I almost don't know why I was pointing up here. Yeah, this right here is the new Unify. Uh, this is a PoE Pro Max 48 port switch. So this is a, it's an incremental upgrade. I already have the 48 port Pro, uh, but the Pro Max adds a few extra features that I think are gonna be creature comforts in the long run. It's gonna make maintaining this and identifying ports, etc., much easier because it's got RGB baked in. Unboxing server equipment is my new favorite pastime. This is like Christmas morning. Oh yeah, she's a big one. Like I said, the Pro Max actually includes RGB LEDs in individual ports. So they're port specific. You can fine tune them to tell you a bunch of different things about devices connected to the network or different VLANs that you've got set up. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool idea. I don't think it's fully fleshed out yet, but uh, hey, it's an upgrade. I bet this is a view of me you never thought you'd see. So I have taken a picture of where each of these uh, hatch cables runs. I just want to keep it all the same. It, it shouldn't hurt anything in the, in the grand scheme of things because I haven't actually mapped where each of these goes. Just so there aren't any surprises when we go about setting up the new 48 port PoE Pro Max switch. You know, it's kind of like Apple. You got the Pro, then we got the Pro Max. You know, there's a lot of things that uh, Ubiquity and Apple have in common. Definitely want to hold this while we're removing these Phillips screws. It's a lot of weight being held by four of these at the front of the rack. And here we go. So out with the old. Let's not forget our arms. Got a little bit of peeling goodness. And in with the new. All right, this is, this is the part that can be kind of difficult as a one man operation. So I've got to kind of hold this up from behind and then get these screws started. Just gonna hold it as upright as I can. I'm gonna try to get this as flat as possible, but just inevitably with how heavy it is, yeah, it's, it's bound to sag over time. But we'll do something about that in the near future. 12 o'clock midnight. You know, that's actually pretty straight. It's not perfect, but it's better than where we started. Check that out though. Just powered it up. Haven't even connected any patch cables and we've already got some pretty sweet RGB action going on here. I know this is like the stupidest thing. I know some of you server guys are like, dude, this is, this is this is pretty lame, Greg, but I think it's awesome. I actually think this does provide some utility. Uh, it just needs to be tweaked a little bit. From the reviews that I've seen, there are certain things that these lights can't do yet that I think would make a world of difference for a switch like this. We can also say goodbye to these old patch cables, which uh, I'll be honest, I really didn't like when I first saw these. They're very rigid. I guess this is just to make sure that they're strong and they'll bend or break when they're connected, but I, I just don't like them. They don't look good when connected, and uh, in my opinion, yeah, I've seen better. And that's where these ether lightning patch cables come into play. I know it's like impossible to read that. There you go, ether lighting. That's what they're calling these. And they're actually a lot more flexible from what I could see online. They also are semi-transparent, which means that the LEDs from each of these ports should shine it through the heads of these patch cables just to make things look, uh, I don't know, cool? Just makes them look cool. And I know it won't matter for these older devices, but uh, I'm gonna use these transparent cables for 
them as well, just because I think they look so much cleaner. You can see I've got my photo here from before and all I'm doing is just connecting these one by one to the same ports. And look at that, some of these are already lit up, which is super cool. There is something so therapeutic about this part, just connecting patch cables and the way that it all looks in the end. This is such a rewarding feeling. I don't know why, I guess it's just because I'm not very used to it yet, so it still feels foreign to me and uh, oh, it's exciting. I, I just it's something that I am still learning a lot about, very clearly, but um, I appreciate you guys coming along for the ride. And check it out. This is why I personally like Unify products so much. It is so easy for noobs like me to set up. It, it's, it's so hassle-free. It automatically detected the new device. I'm just going to click Setup, and that is literally all it takes. I can name it. I'll just stick with the default name for now, and that's it. It's literally like it's just one click adoption. Like there's nothing else I need to do. There's no setting up that needs to be done apart from clicking a couple of buttons. And uh, well, that's speaking my language. And would you look at that? We are already up and running. Something I didn't notice that uh, this does is tell you already what device is connected to each port. So this is my living room TV. It already sees that. You can see this is actually the computer that we're looking at this uh, display on, Proxima here. So that's really cool. Also took some time to relocate the UDM and the modem. They're now closer to the upper patch panel. I couldn't uh, get these uh, little 15 centimeter uh, patch cables to reach from the UDM to the uh, the upper panel. So uh, this way I think it looks a lot cleaner. This also prepares us for the next thing I want to talk about. So this blank space up top now is actually going to more than likely be another modem. And I say more than likely because I'm not entirely sure how to set up the next thing I purchased that being Starlink. Now, Elon Musk was super cool on X. He posted that he was gonna make Starlink free for those affected by hurricanes Helene and Milton for the remainder of the year. The only thing we'd have to pay is the upfront cost for the actual product. He accompanied his post with a graphic of the affected areas. These would be the places that were eligible for the uh, free service for the remainder of the year. Of course, my county was in that. We didn't have power uh, shortly after the hurricane hit and Spectrum Internet went down almost immediately after. I think about three or four hours after we lost power, Spectrum cut out as well. Uh, now if I had had an on-site like long-term battery backup solution, maybe I would have gotten 24, 48 hours of extra power depending on what was connected to it. That would have been great for the local network. I could have still stored, you know, security footage and stuff like that on the NVR. But once Spectrum went down as well, that was it. I had no other internet backup and so Starlink is going to be a great way for me to uh, potentially communicate with uh, family members and friends uh, if everything else is down. And the one problem with living this far outside the city, apart from having to rely on only one ISP, which is a real, uh, it's a real kick in the teeth, is the fact that once that ISP goes down, everyone starts using their cell phones. I mean, th that's what you do, right? I mean, you use your cell phones anyway, but if you don't have Wi-Fi, you're going to use data. And because cell service is sort of kind of spotty out here, the towers become bogged down very quickly. So I, I couldn't place calls, I could barely send text messages, MMS was out of the question, uh, and if I wanted to surf the web, good luck. <laughs> I couldn't even download emails. It was, it was pretty abysmal for about three or four days. I had family members worrying about me because they couldn't get in touch with me. So having something like Starlink, again, could be a way to um, just stay connected. It might not work during the storm. This is satellite we're talking about after all, and it has massively improved over the old school satellite internet days, but it definitely will work once the storm passes. And as long as, again, I have power, some sort of backup, I should be A-OK. -okay. The next thing on my agenda will be to purchase a second UPS. This size was fine. I think it was, uh, what, again, around 75-ish, 80 minutes of runtime once the two large servers were disconnected because, again, th those shouldn't have been connected to begin with. Uh, but I think I want a second one. I'm going to have one of these hooked up uh, specifically for the NVR. I think I'm just going to run the NVR off of one by itself. That should last at least 90-plus minutes, Pro probably more than that. But, uh, you know, if I have intermittent power issues, say there's, like, a small thunderstorm or something, Something, maybe not hurricane related, but a little more isolated, uh, then maybe this will keep me up and running through that downtime. And then I'll have the second uh, hooked up to this stuff up here. So the, uh, the modem and the UDM and the PoE switch. I have a gasoline generator. I mean, it's rustic, it's old school, but it gets the job done. So worst case, I plug, uh, you know, my freezers into that and then I plug Starlink into that. And then there we go. You know, I had I could uh, connect the servers to it as well and be good to go. I would ideally like to move away from a gas generator because they're extremely loud. You have to have gas as well on hand and sometimes it's difficult to find gas at gas stations during hurricanes. That's really the only 
remaining bottleneck, opting for an old school generator. I actually got a quote to go completely off the grid at this house when we first built it. So they told me I would need solar panels across the entire east side of my roof line, the entire south side of my roof line, and that I would need about three Tesla power walls to take care of it, to do everything, to power all the AC stuff, to power the stoves and the fridges, etc., etc. The quote was, uh, it was a lot, <laughs> including install about $80,000. That's, that's nuts. Again, I don't want to put a lien on this house. I'm not, I already have a lien on the house. It's, the house is not paid off, but I don't want to put a second lien on it in case we decide to sell it. And then that, that gets rolled over to the next owner and that, that can complicate the sale and stuff. It just not something I'm interested in. And I don't want to write a check because I'm not in a place to write a check that big right now. So uh, I am just going to stick with gasoline generators for now. Maybe I'll stock up on some gas ahead of time. And uh, if I have to, I can just rely on that. I mean, it's, it's something, right? I, I can't complain. It's the cheap, effective solution. And practically every neighbor in this neighborhood was using a gasoline generator to keep the import stuff up and running. It was extremely loud. I woke up every morning at like 7 a.m. to just a bunch of buzzing, like <laughs> single cylinder gasoline generators running. But it gets the job done. I can't complain. It's smart to have something like that on hand, especially if you live in a place like Florida that is prone to hurricanes. So all I'd have to do is make sure that that generator is on, make sure that it's filled up with gas, and then connect it to, say, the freezer, the fridge, uh, the other freezer in the garage, this server rack behind me, and Starlink. And that should get me back up and running. I'll have internet, uh, which is important. I would say that's more important than having power across the entire house, as long as, again, the perishable stuff can stay cool or frozen. That is really all I'm concerned with. And of course, once Tesla power walls or their equivalents are installed probably in the garage, we can move away from those primitive fossil fuel driven generators. Look at all these patch cables, which we will not be using anymore. I want to thank you for watching this rather impromptu video. I know this wasn't filmed in a formal setting, and I'll be honest, the reason why is because I am extremely far behind on work. I have not been this far behind on video production since my college days, and it largely has to do with the fact that I didn't have power or internet for almost a week. And this might sound like me complaining, but I choose to live here. I choose to live in Florida. I love the beaches. I don't love the traffic and the old people and sometimes the insurance, but the insurance is way worse for folks that live near the coast. You don't have to pay corporate or personal income taxes here, which is also great. So I think from a, from a small business perspective, for me, it makes sense to live in Florida. The kids love the theme parks. My family's here as well. Um, I, I do love this state, but hurricanes are also a fact of life here. And uh, so I'm, I'm navigating this new construction, how to better handle hurricane situations. I don't know, maybe this video is not for everyone, but uh, I just wanted to be candid, show you some of the things that, uh, that I've noticed as of late, and uh, hopefully I can pick up the regular content here very soon. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, leave a comment down below, and uh, consider sticking around for the next one. My name is Greg. Thanks for learning with me.